they said that our world is becoming one big global village. Cross-border trades is what makes it smaller. Earlier, it used to be enabled by logistics, the ships, air, whatever available, and that promoted the cross-border trade. Then came technology, and cross-border trade became easier. And now we have treaties which enable cross-border trade. India is one of the latest or last entrants in the global economy. 20, 25 years back, we started our liberalization and on account of which inward, outward trade has increased substantially. Along with the increase in trade comes litigation. And the ways to solve litigation, the ways to take care of these issues, Because of these litigation, there would have been judgments, and these judgments become benchmarks, they become guiding factors for future trade and structuring of trade. One of the reasons for increased litigation is a concept called base erosion and profit shifting. Simply put, this is nothing but erosion of a country's tax base by shifting income and profits to low tax or no tax jurisdictions. DTAAs were initially executed to avoid double taxation of taxpayers' income. Some companies, some countries offered low or no tax rates to lure investments into their country. International tax laws, which were drafted eons ago, have been outsmarted by the SSEs, as is infamously famous. Before a new law gets passed, the loopholes are simultaneously conceived. The international tax laws are being used to avoid even single taxation by companies. No doubt high tax continues, con sorry, no, no doubt high tax countries end up feeling deprived of their share of taxes. With the economic downturn, the developed countries have also felt the pinch of reducing revenues. Finance ministers of the G20 countries had approached the OECD to initiate measures to mitigate BEPS. On 19th July 2013, OECD came out with a concept paper with a comprehensive action plan with 15 action points to be completed within a period of two years. The outcome of this action plan is expected to impact the course of existing international tax and transfer pricing principles. The OECD's analysis in its BEPS report is an urgent call to design a new international tax system. Today's lecture is by Mr. Poras Kaka on this very subject. But before we begin the lecture, uh, I'd like to introduce the chairman of this session. Mr. Dinesh Vyas, sorry, sorry, extremely sorry, Mr. Y.P. Trivedi, is a friend of BCA. He has been associated with BCA and we've had a long relationship. His achievements in the field of law, politics, and other areas are well known to us. He's a director of many, many large companies. He's on the board of a lot of trade bodies, associations, and he is actively now involved in politics also. Uh, with that, uh, may I request uh, Nitin to give a momento. <coughs> Welcome you, sir, and I apologize for. I'm not a, I'm not a state speaker, and I, I attend. All our friends of BC. And one who forgives is a bigger friend. The speaker for today, Poros Kaka. Uh, before I give his introduction, 
uh, let me say that today we are also felicitating him uh, and that he is a senior advocate who has completed the LLM from Harvard Law School. He has completed his education from the Cathedral School and Sydenham College. Just one second. designated senior advocate in 2010 by the High Court. He is India's representative on the Permanent Scientific Committee of the International Fiscal Association, Netherlands from 2004 to 2011. He has been awarded the Client Choice Award for 2011 by ILO for Corporate Tax Laws for India. He is named by the Chambers and Partners 2010, 2011, 12 as one of India's leading senior tax advocates. He is named one of India's leading tax councils by International Tax Review, appointed an expert witness on Indian tax law in London in international arbitration, appointed on editorial board of the World Tax Journal published by IBFD. And the reason we are felicitating him today is he is appointed the worldwide president of the International Tax Fiscal Association, International Fiscal Association, Netherlands, and I'll do the honor. function of uh, Puras Kaka, I was so happy. But then, you know, I have seen your latest calendar where you have shown how the chartered accountants are doing double jobs. Some politician and builder and everywhere you are there. So here also you have done the double job of not only felicitating him, but asking him to justify the felicitation. <laughs> by making him speak. Now, I have been to mind whether I should uh, speak on my dear friend Bonus Kaka or should I also touch his subject about the judgments. Uh, I had a very strange experience in this very room when I was speaking on budget and uh, the presiding uh, person was a senior chartered accountant. So he had to preside and introduce me. But being uh, a senior chartered accountant, he could not control himself. So he started speaking about the budget. Spoke for one hour. <laughs> and analyzed all the sections. And in the last three lines, he says, now oh, Mr. Trivedi will address us on budgets. I said, now what is left? And this I speak for next year's budget. <laughs> So, I don't want to touch on the subject. It's a very interesting subject. Base erosion and profit shifting. And one can speak at great length. Even if one were to look at Vodafone's judgment running into more than 100 pages. Uh, for us, I will tell you in my time, 
whenever the court would not grant us an adjournment, we'll insist on reading the Delhi Cross News judgment, which used to read, 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 read about 200 pages. There are so many dissenting judgments and this and that. And the moment we start reading, because it is the right of the advocate to read any judgment that he wants, the court will say we'll adjourn the matter. <laughs> So I don't want to go into Justice Rajiv Das' uh, discussion about dispute resolution panel and transfer price king. And as it was rightly mentioned by Mr. Panjwani, it's a loss to the government, this tax planning and transfer pricing. And those, apart from the fact that the tax burden goes on the other entities, the single nation business entities, they suffer. Because they have no chance of shifting their burden from one place to a place where there is no taxation or very low taxation. And I can talk for a long time. I have talked at great length in Parliament on this Bali summit when the minister, Commerce Minister told me that wherever you are, you come here and support me on this Bali summit. Because some people who, had, who didn't know anything, some of my leftist friends, they were attacking that uh, it is not India's triumph, it is India's defeat. And I uh, protected him, I talked at great length about what are the various uh, segments of trade policies, how bilateral trade policies, multilateral trade policies, how trade blocks are generated. And the minister was very happy that I assisted him in the entire process. So I would rather not speak on the subject at length. I'll speak on porous. I knew porous father, Faruk, who was my very good friend. And apart from being, in, I might tell you something which is more relevant, because apart from being an excellent advocate and a hardworking lawyer in Mr. Nani Balkiyavala's chamber, he was a great human being. Typical Parsi kindness was a part of his life. He was very fond of dogs. And when I wanted to purchase a dog, and I thought uh, being a Parsi and a dog lover, he will guide me properly. So I asked him about various pedigree dogs. And he told me, don't get annoyed by these pedigrees. Our dogs, Indian dogs, which we call Palia or something, they are equally good. And he had picked up a dog which was, which was overrun by a car and injured. He took it up, took him at home. And that dog, you know, he was very fond of. He says, very intelligent, responding in the same way as a pedigree dog like Alsatian or Spitz or a Pomeranian would do. So I personally knew that he was not just interested in dog, but he was a very fine human being, very kind-hearted man. And he rightly advised me to go in for any type of dog and did not necessarily go into for a pedigree dog. Uh, Porus, as it is mentioned, had a very bright career. He was at Harvard and many few people know and you may not like to talk about it. But our, the President of United States of America, Obama, was his classmate. And he had some. <coughs> and then I met uh, President Obama in Parliament in the Central Hall. I had told him that your friend uh, uh, Porus Kaka is remembering you. He says, Where is he? Where is he? He was unconscious. That means there was some sort of an intimacy. I think Porus is a person who doesn't become aggressive who has not tried, doesn't try to throw himself at anybody. I do not know whether he has maintained a relationship or not. If he would have stayed in America, probably he would have been on a very high position in Obama's uh, secretariat. So, he is uh, a man, you know, who is very well connected. And at a very young age, he has become the president of FIA, International Fiscal Association. And I have been told, he is not only the first Indian, but the first Asian to acquire this. <laughs> for which we, in the country, can be very proud. And I think it is very interesting, because when he came here, he was telling me, in the first few years, he was thinking of going back to America. 
But then, after having stayed here for some time, he started loving the country. And now he says, no question of going back. And today, we as Indians feel proud of the fact that he is the first Asian to have become the president of International Fiscal Association. He is quiet, humble, kind-hearted, very much committed to his clients. And I have been to his house, you know, at some dinners. And I have seen of his colleagues who are there in his committee. They also love him very much. I believe that all men cannot become great, but everybody can be good. In Porus, we have the combination of both. He is not only good, he is also great. So let us salute a good and great lawyer. Before Porus uh, gets up to give his speech, there's one small film that he has made. Uh, and there's a film on, on IFA. Okay. okay. So we'll, uh, we'll air that film. I want to introduce the film. film is about it. Uh, friends, the IFA, International Fiscal Association, holds their annual congress worldwide every year at different places. It, uh, we are fortunate that with Por during Porres' regime as the world president of IFA, we are going to have the World Congress in Mumbai in this year. And on, in October, uh, the dates are 5th to 12th, sorry, 12th to 17th of October in Mumbai. And this is only the second time that India had the honor to hold this Congress. The earlier one was 17 years back in Delhi. So this film is basically meant for international delegates which talks about what these congresses are and it mainly promotes Mumbai but uh, we thought it was a good time to show this when we are felicitating for us. Mumbai has a wide range of hotel options, 
depending on what you are looking for, the conference will be held at NCPA and many other prestigious venues. The conference will discuss interesting and contemporary topics. counterparts and peers. It is also unique in the fact that normally in a council's life you would be expecting to be standing for approximately three hours during the day, during court hours, giving time for the other side to argue. By the end of this evening I may have completed six and a half to seven. In this evening's subject, I will take you from what is the current law in India to what it can be across the world. Also, I will tell you how the international context will affect you. And if by the end you have fallen asleep, I will also show you a little movie. I will start with four cases. As you are aware, IFA is a neutral organization. So I have selected four very carefully. Two in favor of the assessee and two against the revenue. <laughs> no, I digress. There will be two in favor of the revenue. So I begin with one of the recent judgments of the Madras High Court which are in favor of the revenue. As you are aware, we have a lot of telecommunications disputes in India. So Verizon Communications Singapore contracted with an Indian company to provide bandwidth to an Indian SSE through VSNL terminals. This company was engaged in the business of providing international connectivity. And as you are aware, IPLC is kind of a circuit that gives end-to-end -end connectivity from India to customers outside India. The tax officer held in this case that what IPLC is doing is taxable under the Act and the DTAA as royalty and two parts, both as use of equipment and also use of a process. The ITO also held that there is a nexus between the user, the situs of the usage, and the purpose. One thing remember, these were all assessment years starting from 2002-03 up to 8-9. I will come to this a little later because of our certain legal retrospective amendments. What the officer held is that the Singapore company was giving the right to access and to exploit the system to use the capacity of the system 
and that falls within the definition of royalty as he understood it. One interesting thing that happened between the time that the matter reached the tribunal and went to the High Court was several retrospective amendments in our Finance Act of 2012, which as you are aware, not only dealt with indirect transfers, that is the crux of the Vodafone issue, but also retrospectively amended the definition of royalty to include within itself the meaning of an expanded term of process, which included transmission by satellites, cables, optic fibers, etc. You must remember that when somebody gives you bandwidth, somebody gives you facility on, on, on transponders, there is technically no lease of any equipment. There is technically no equipment placed at your disposal. This is a part of an, not only internationally accepted, but I think even domestic law. For example, if I was to lease a vehicle, that would be at my disposal. If somebody drove the car, that does not amount to the lease of the vehicle by me because that vehicle is not put at my disposal. The amendments to the definitions prescribe that irrespective of who had the right to use, whether the asset was at the disposal, it would still amount to a lease. Unfortunately, and I do believe here the High Court has erred, it has held the following, that the payments do amount to royalty both under the Act and under the, under the DTA. The services involve the use of equipment and hence trigger equipment royalty. Though the equipment is placed at the customer's end, it is compatible with the equipment outside India and there is use of cables and equipment in the transmission. The fundamental error is what is the equipment and what is the process? What is use of the process? Only if all these three are the same can the High Court's conclusion be upheld. Because normally, as you would understand, if you were to use a process, you would use it as an intermediary step to achieve something else. When the process itself is the use that you describe, there is something which is missing in this interpretation. A process must be used. The process itself can't be the royalty. Despite this, the court does hold that the customer has significant economic interest in the equipment. Surprisingly, the court holds that the DTA and the Act is in pari materia. And therefore, to interpret the DTA looks at the retrospective amendments in domestic law. The other factual things I won't go to, but a few things that the court overlooks is, when you take domestic law and when you take tax treaty law, a domestic amendment retrospective or otherwise cannot apply automatically to a treaty. No part of the, and let me tell you, this is not the court's fault. Not a single discussion or submission is made on international commentary. No part of the OECD view is given to the court. No part of domestic versus treaty law is given to the court. 3.2 has not been discussed. What is the meaning of process is not discussed. And hence, perhaps, the court has proceeded on this basis that the domestic law amendments automatically apply and are merely clarificatory of the international norm. Now, this decision, you will contrast it with the Andhra Pradesh High Court in Sanofi, which had to consider the same retrospective amendments qua indirect transfers, and which were, again, specifically targeted to indirect transfers, and the court, while analyzing, has come out with a detailed analysis of 3.2 of the treaty, how domestic law interacts with treaty law, how domestic law will not automatically apply to treaty law, and certainly how retrospective amendments cannot change a treaty situation. And that is, I think, normal. 
If you sign a treaty, you can't amend the treaty by amending your domestic law. But this is a judgment which certainly has come from the Chennai High Court and will be used by the revenue to argue that the definitions, retrospective and otherwise, in domestic law can automatically apply to the treaty. But again, when you want to distinguish this judgment, remember, you will find missing all the discussions on interpretive principles, OECD commentary, 3-2. There is nothing in this judgment which leads us to this conclusion. I then come to our rather famous assessee in India, Vodafone. Now, Vodafone has been rather uh, going through the tax system on several things. This was a matter where directly after the TPO's order, Vodafone approached the High Court and said his order is bad in law. The DRP has no powers to adjudicate on this issue. Please quash this transfer pricing assessment. Now if you will see what the figures are. You will notice that this is 88,434 crores. Let me digress. When I started out my practice and there was a tax demand of one or two crores, this was a high demand case for a junior counsel. Today I'm sure, and that includes my probably my juniors who without which I would not be here with this presentation and I must express my gratitude to them. Any self-respecting person in this room would probably turn down a matter which has one or two crores because the numbers have just multiplied and in the last few years I have seen direct tax litigation which normally is in excess of hundreds of crores of assessment. So this is the change that you will find from when I started out my practice that tax disputes will be in the thousands of crores. However, good times will not last. And for all of you, those who are interested in these 8,000 crores, you know that if Mr. Gadkari comes into power, he might abolish the Income Tax Act. We have, of course, Mr. Trivedi, who will hopefully vociferously object in Parliament to any such uh, proposal. Coming back to the case, so Vodafone did not report two transactions. One was a sale of a call center and one was an alleged sale of options held by various persons in Vodafone in the Indian company. The arguments of the SSE were that number one, qua the call center, it was not even a connected enterprise. Vodafone had not purchased the call center. It was an associated enterprise of Hutch. The question of the transfer pricing applying to this would not arise. It was not an international transaction. As far the call options go, they said the matter is concluded. Supreme Court has decided this issue. Call options have not been transferred. Supreme Court says this so, so ten times in its order. And there, where is the question then of putting a transfer pricing issue? The High Court ultimately dismissed Vodafone's matter writ petition only on the principal ground of alternative remedy and they said this is not a case for exercising the extraordinary jurisdiction of the court as there are several issues of fact and law which had to be considered. The interesting part of this judgment is really on the DRP powers. The High Court holds that the DRP can confirm, reduce or enhance under 1448 and that power includes the power to delete the addition completely, to decide whether it was an international transaction itself. So the jurisdiction of the DRP was held to be extremely wide in this case. It is not a final decision. The DRP, I think, is considering this. I am told it may have already done so. And as I said, the interesting part of this decision is really on what are the powers of the DRP. Very briefly, I'll come to a recent tribunal decision, and now we come to the decisions in favor of the SSC. You are aware of this dispute on second mint, which has gone on, where in foreign, uh, foreign employees are seconded to India. This was a case of Temasek seconding employees to India to work in its Indian subsidiary. The employees continued to be on the payrolls of the Singapore company, However, the entire salary was subjected to TDS in India 
withheld and deposited with the Indian Revenue. The Indian company merely reimbursed the salary to the parent. What did the department say? Even on this reimbursement, salary which has been deducted in TDS, further TDS has to be done. On what basis? This is FTS. What are the consequences disallowed under 40A1? So you will realize that on a transaction of 100 rupees, effectively, tax department may be recovering tax thrice over, not twice. Once on the salary leg, once on the FTS leg, once on the 40A1 leg. And that's not all about this decision. Because you can have a legal argument on second mint, you can legal have a legal argument on FTS. But I think what is thrown, every single thing is thrown in the book. That your books don't match, this is this, this is color, this is doctored, etc, etc. And to create the case and to create triple withholding was the concern that we had to go through in this court. Ultimately, fortunately for us, the tribunal was extremely fair. They refused to get colored or affected by various arguments that this rupee doesn't tally, this decimal point is missing, this agreement was signed on day one but the signatures of day two, this person was in Mumbai, how can he be in Singapore while signing? They refused to get colored by all these facts and ultimately held that this is a transaction which cannot be processed in India twice over. And finally, they came to these following conclusions. I won't read them and trouble you with them because they are part of the reported judgment. Finally, the recent decision of the Delhi High Court in Lien Fung. And this is also interesting from a point of transfer pricing view and how really the system works. As you're aware, Lien Fung is one of the largest of so of sourcing entities in the world. So if US GAAP wants a t-shirt to be made, they will come to Li Fung Hong Kong. Li Fung Hong Kong have offices in 40 countries across the world. They will find out which factory can make it, which factory can make it competitively, source it, and then offer it to GAAP. GAAP will then decide which factory it wants to place the order. Li Fung has offices in 40 countries who do this work and they are remunerated obviously on a cost plus basis. Hong Kong gets 5% of the goods. This 5% has to be shared by 40 countries including the headquarters. When the matter came to the TPO, he was of the view that India does so much work and that this is a part of the goods so rather than on the Indian cost, what he said is, I will apply 5% on the cost of the goods which are ultimately sold. Now if you tax in India 5% of the contract value for which the Indian company has nothing to do, and the Hong Kong company is still paying all these entities cost plus, it means that you are taxing in India more than the gross revenues of the entire group from the transaction. This was unfortunately upheld by the DRP. When the matter went to the tribunal, there was utter confusion in the tribunal. They felt what the assessee had done was wrong. They felt what the department was done was wrong because obviously you can't assess more than the gross receipts of the entire group in India. So they came up with what I call an arbitration. They said India should receive 80% of the gross receipt. Hong Kong should receive 20% of the gross receipt. There is no basis in transfer pricing law for this arbitration to be done by the tribunal. It was unheard of. Good news for the taxpayer. Their cost plus in India worked out to 80% of the gross receipt. With the result that arithmetically, the taxpayer did not have a rupee to pay. But as a matter of transfer pricing law, this judgment turned transfer pricing on its head because it's not up to the tribunal to decide, oh, you should get 80, you should get 20, and somebody else should get 10. Point is, who are the comparables? What is the analysis? What is the result? Fortunately, the Delhi High Court has now reversed it. There are very good comments in that for how to apply TNMM how to work TNMM and how to analyze and deal with the assessee's transfer pricing details. 
So these, I would say, are a few of the recent judgments. I won't deal with them individually, but come straight away to the next subject, which I hope perhaps is of equal interest, which is BEPS. So now I'm going to take you to the international context and what the law currently is and what international tax is going to look like not 10 years down the line but according to the OECD calendar about 9 months from today or 8 months from today. So why are politicians so concerned about BEPS? Firstly, for all those, what is BEPS? BEPS stands for Base Erosion and Profit Shifting. It refers to tax planning strategies that exploit gaps and mismatches in tax rules to make profits disappear for tax purposes. This is what the OECD says on FAQs for BEPS. BEPS has a culture of itself. It has an FAQ page and now I am told the OECD about two weeks ago has released a BEPS calendar. So now you have an FAQ page, you have a BEPS page, you have a BEPS calendar. I am sure all of you all who have been in the past looking at the Kingfisher calendar will now, will now in 2014 switch over to the BEPS calendar. So this BEPS is the concern that profits are disappearing. My answer is profits are not disappearing. Profits are only reappearing in the Cayman Islands and Bahamas where the tax departments don't like it. So profits don't disappear. Even when you look at a multinational's operations, its profits don't disappear. They only reappear where the governments do not like it. Why is BEPS such, the, such a hot topic? Three, three weeks ago, I mentioned at the FIT conference that if figures are to be believed, base erosion and profit shifting represents more than 100 Chennai Expresses put together. Three weeks from today, from the statistics that I have seen, I will revise that to more than 100 Doom 3s put together. So you can see how these figures are changing. You have to be aware of BEPS because if the OECD promises to do what it purposes to do, international tax law will change completely. The reason why the politicians are interested in BEPS is two reasons. Financial, every country is having a financial crisis. Secondly, public pressure. There is huge public pressure and huge agitation when you report in the papers that those who are wealthy and powerful can have a very low effective tax rate. And when the ordinary man is expected to pay a high tax rate, or a, it, this is not fair. So the debate is now becoming in, not into the effective tax rate, not into the maximum tax rate, but into a moral tax rate. Let me ask all of you, do you think, or how many of you in this audience think that there is something which is correct and which is a moral tax rate? I would expect this answer from a group of professionals. There is nothing like a moral tax rate to a professional. But that is not an answer that appeals to the layman, that appeals to the public. Today when laymen and individuals and salaried earners are paying tax rates of 30% and 35%, and they see large corporations having an effective tax rate of 5 and 10 and 15%, in their minds, there is something wrong. In their minds, there is something morally incorrect. So what would be a moral tax rate? I have said this before. If the maximum rate is 30%, the moral tax rate will be between 22 to 30%. That is probably what the public may, this is just an estimate. But if your effective tax rate is 5 and 10, the public may not accept what the corporation is doing.
So what is this debate? There is increased attention in the media. There is a spreading perception. Again, this is a perception that multinationals are able to avoid their legitimate share of taxes. And this debate has reached the top of the political agenda. In 2012, the G20 finance ministers made this statement. We welcome the work that the OECD is undertaking into the problem of base erosion and profit shifting and look forward to its report about progress at the next meeting. The next meetings happened immediately after that. And in February 2013, the first BEPS report was released. Remember, in every single report, it is accepted that what the companies are doing today is legal. There is nothing illegal in what they are doing. They are legitimately paying their share of tax according to the rules. It is like what Arthur Godfrey said, I am proud to be paying taxes to the United States. The only thing is, I could be just as proud for half that money. That is what they are doing and it is absolutely legal. So the debate is now how to change this system where there is a perception that global corporations can exploit the system. And why does this arise globally and not domestically? The answer is very simple. If both the taxpayer who deducts the payment and the recipient of that payment is within your jurisdiction, you can control the taxation. But if the recipient of the payment is outside your jurisdiction, you don't know how that country is taxing, how that person is being taxed, and this gives rise to perhaps double non-taxation. In the 1960s, our conventions were drafted for avoiding double taxation. In 2013, the work is to avoid double non-taxation. So you can see how the pendulum has shifted. So how big a problem is BEPS? Let me answer it. Nobody knows. There is something that they feel that there is, but the statistics are not greatly analyzed. And please see the last bullet point on this page. The data of corporate tax receipts in the OECD countries do not show a drop. So is there a problem? The answer is yes. The reason is, if you will look at the statistics, the British Virgin Islands is the second largest foreign direct investor into China at 14%. What is USA? 4%. You look at Cyprus, it is a major investor into Russia. You look at India and you look at Mauritius, 24% of India's investments comes through Mauritius. So they know there's a problem. Everyone knows that they have a stomach ache. They only, they are not sure whether it's an appendix or a kidney stone. So they are working to find a solution and in July 2013, a detailed action plan has come about. As I pointed out, this is not only a plan, but has set very ambitious timelines. And these timelines are so ambitious that everything has to be done by mostly September 2013, including rewriting concepts on the digital economy, rewriting perhaps certain issues on P, etc., etc., all has to be done by September 2013 so that we are ready for IFA in October 2013. <coughs> so what does this action plan say? It breaks up the challenges for the international community into 15 points. Those 15 points are categorized on three pillars. Firstly, according to them, the coherence of the corporate tax at the international level is at stake. There must be a reali realignment of taxation with substance. And transparency must be coupled with certainty and predictability. These are wonderful words, and I do wish the OECD good luck. I do know that a, a lot of hard work is going on. 
but I am still doubtful if you can achieve everything. They will achieve something which I know, which I will come to a little later. For example, today there is a lot on debate, warehouses are not peas. If warehouses are not peas, you must realize that for companies that are selling online, that's a complete way out. Today only servers are peas and not websites. That is another way out. You don't have a server. How do you realign this entire concept of taxation? And at the same time, you must remember, some of the larger countries, I won't name them, do not want BEPs to be converted into source taxation. That is not the answer for BEPs. So what will you do? Will you dilute the PE principle? The answer is no. Will you only give credit system? The answer may be yes. And finally, item number five, counter harmful tax practices. What are harmful tax practices? Reducing your rates competitively to a tax haven level. Some of the major countries in Europe have tax rates that border on tax havens. Even the United Kingdom has brought down its rate to 20% and is promising to reduce it further. Will you call the United Kingdom a tax haven? Surely no. <coughs> Countries like Netherlands, Singapore would strongly object to them, the, themselves being described as tax havens. But ask the Indian Revenue what their view will be and it will be quite different from that perspective. So I think this is going to be a huge challenge of coordinating. Now you can't ask a country to reduce its tax, to have a certain basic rate. Then how will you lim limit this problem? Because if any country steps out of line, people are going to flock to that country. Today we have three, BVI, Cyprus, Mauritius, Cayman Islands, etc. But these are not necessarily, but once the larger countries start competing competitively, who are you going to, who are you going to stop? Then substance. Substance, in my opinion, is like the famous statement, which is beauty, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Same is true for substance. Where a taxpayer sees substance, revenue sees tax avoidance. That is why, fortunately, in India, we have the courts. Substance, as the OECD says, is something that they want to strengthen. Substance is a word that is not found in the, t in the tax treaties. And I looked up the Oxford English Dictionary. The first meaning of substance is with regard to the being of God. All I can say is God knows how to find it. Then if you will see some of the other things, coherence, actions two to five. I won't take you individually through these. These are available on the website. But I will take you to what has been achieved. And this is significant and you must make a note. The development of multilateral tax instruments. If the plan is that by September we will have drafted solutions to the digital economy, solutions to transfer pricing, solutions to value creation, solutions to markets, there is no way you can implement them in thousands of bilateral tax treaties. The only way forward will be to have a multilateral tax instrument where all countries will sign at one time. According to the OECD, this is an inclusive work, but I think much more care must be taken to involve the multinationals in this process Otherwise, it seems to be targeted at them when they, are, when they ultimately are following the, the, the rules. And you must remember that it is wrong to target one person. When a government robs Peter to pay Paul, they can count on Paul's support. But what happens to Peter in this process? I won't trouble you with the organization of work. This is what the OECD is currently doing. They are also consulting with business on this project. And finally, these are the deadlines that have been set by the OECD to come up with answers to all these problems. So if you will see, 
that by September 2014, digital economy, hybrid mismatch, harmful tax practices, treaty abuse, transfer pricing intangibles, documentation and multilateral instruments are expected to be completed. This is a lot. In one year, we are going to change, if it happens, the international tax system faster than what we have done in the entire last 50 years. If this work succeeds, it is going to revolutionize the tax system. So what are the achievements already today? And I would say the multilateral instrument on mutual assistance is one. What is this? This renders all of our exchange of information agreements basically irrelevant if it is implemented in spirit. This obliges countries to exchange tax details bank details, other information of not only the treaty counterpart, but even third persons in their country and give it to them. And what are the methods you will exchange it? <coughs> Automatically, spontaneously and simultaneously. These are adjectives meaning happy. You know who is going to be happy if it is automatic, simultaneous and also <coughs> spontaneous. So if this is implemented, and please note Switzerland has signed this, Liechtenstein has signed this, if information is going to be automatic, spontaneous and simultaneous, I think one thing is going to go away and that perhaps is the right thing and that is illegal bank accounts. I do believe that whatever happens to the PE rule, I do believe that whatever happens on transfer pricing, whether solutions come or they don't come, the political consensus on illegal money and tax havens will happen, unless of course the politicians are themselves involved, but otherwise it will happen and therefore illegal bank accounts you will not find a place to run and hide easily going forward. However, the rest of BEPS is a question mark how it comes and I only hope, hope it doesn't end up like the Irish government committee which set up a 23-man committee to reform its tax system and they had the chairman's report and 22 dissenting reports. Now, what are the obligations for Indian Chartered Accountants? I have just asked, and I must say this is the work done by my juniors, to run through the duties and obligations that you have currently under both the Income Tax Act and also the New Companies Act. When I talk about these obligations, the reason I'm going to link BEPS with these obligations is the public pressure and the public scrutiny that is going to happen. Fortunately, lawyers don't have to give certificates and I had the pleasure of your, your committee in my chamber and they said that lawyers fight the fire, CAs sign the fire at the beginning of the thing. So fortunately, we don't have that problem. But I can assure you that if I had to sign 10 number of certificates, I probably would have to give up practice for at least three weeks before I sign even one. This changing perception, this changing perception is going to affect you. Why do I say that? You are going to have scrutiny by non-court actors. Today, you will see that the debate on tax is not going to happen within the four walls of the High Court or the tri Tribunals. You are going to be asked questions by Times now. You are going to be asked questions by the public. Your documents are going to be scrutinized by other forums and by politicians. Why do I say so? At this point, I would like to stop and show you a video of what is happening in the international arena and then bring you back to the Indian arena.
that had over 12,000 business, businesses claim this building as their headquarters. And I've said before, either this is the largest building in the world or the largest tax scam in the world. And businesses who think they can carry on dodging that fair share, or that they can keep on selling to the UK and setting up ever more complex tax arrangements abroad to squeeze their tax bills right down, well, they need to wake up and smell the coffee because the public who buy from them have had enough. It's very hard to be very honest. You can't say that. It is very true. You, you can't true. say that you don't manipulate the, lo the royalty charge. In your case, it's the royalty charge. It's the manipulation of the charges for loans that you make in the UK, wholly owned subsidiaries take out, and the price of coffee, which uh, you, you, know, you charge 20%, whatever the price is for. That's manipulation. It takes money out of the UK, which would otherwise be viewed as profit. So what are you hiding? I don't have any answers, Chair. And I, I said I'm very happy uh, to come back to the Chair on a confidential basis and see whether it's possible to disclose the data. Of the 9.1 billion sales you made in 2011, you said you made 20 million pounds after tax. What did you make before tax? Uh, I would assume, uh, again, those are the figures, uh, as we uh, had a, a tax uh, expense that was around uh, 8 million. Uh, that we're making a profit uh, uh, of the two combined, but I need to check. Uh, so, so you made a profit of 30 million on revenue of 9 billion. Is that what you're saying? Well, well no. We, we, we made, what I'm saying is we made an after-tax profit of 20 million on that specific. So what, what was your profit before tax? Before tax. I don't have that specific number there, but I'm happy to provide you. No, we don't have anything. I mean, honestly, you come to us with absolutely no information. What's your job? So I'm director of public policy for Amazon across Europe. Well, I, mean, I think what we might continue this afternoon, but I think what we're going to have to do is order somebody to come who can give us answers to the questions well, we I'm ask. Very, I, I, and we will order somebody to appear before us who does that, because it's just not acceptable. I don't, think, I don't know what you take us for, but we're not, you know, we need proper answers to perfectly proper questions which are trying to establish the economic activity in this country and therefore what would be a reasonable corporation tax due. That's our job. We, you know, the idea that you come here simply don't answer the questions, pretend ignorance, is just not on. It's awful. Together! Together! We can build the world! We can build the world! will pay somewhere in the range of 20 million pounds in taxes over the next few years. Welfare benefit scroungers, why don't we name and shape those companies that don't pay their tax? And I'd like to see HMRC take more of these companies to court to test the law, because it's not a sort of clear black and white story. Amazon have also been given a pretty hard time by MPs. The company's been asked to explain why a CD or a book bought in pounds sterling on Amazon.co.uk, delivered from a UK warehouse by the Royal Mail, a UK company of course, is registered in Luxembourg. We're running uh, a, a single European uh, business. It comes with the UK. I am. I believe I'm dealing with a UK company. It comes to me via the Royal Mail with a UK stamp on it. That's what happens. And I tell you again, I, I buy. I so far, I might change my mind. I've been purchasing regularly from you in that way. When when did any book that I ever purchased ever get to Luxembourg? Her Majesty's Treasury invites outside advisers into its august corridors to give ministers specialist advice on new tax rules. Then, those same experts go on and advise big firms where the loopholes are and how they can save millions from their tax bills. What's particularly galling is when individuals in these big firms come in, advise the government on how to write a new tax law, then use that law as an opportunity for tax avoidance when they go back into their firm. Poacher turned gamekeeper turned poacher is simply not on and has to stop.
uh, accountants are spending a lot of money on glossy brochures that are going around the world to international investors to say the UK has got a very competitive tax system, uh, that this is a place in which to invest. Uh, that's certainly not something I want to discourage. Well, the UK has got a very competitive tax regime. We brought that in because we want more investment in the UK. I have no objection to people highlighting that to international investors so that we get jobs in the United Kingdom. With all this growth and investment, to the best of our knowledge, Apple has become the largest corporate income taxpayer in America. Last year, our U.S. federal cash effective tax rate was 30.5%, and we paid nearly $6 billion in cash to the U.S. Treasury. That's more than $16 million each day and we expect to pay even more this year. On the campaign, I used to talk about the outrage of a building in the Cayman Islands that had over 12,000 business, business. Debate. You've seen some of the actors. So let me tell you what are the rules currently of BEPS. You will see the slide where I have put in all the rules that are being employed by the currently countries so far. There are no rules. France and Germany have paid bribes to employees in banks to obtain details of their citizens who have illegal bank accounts. India has obtained those details gift tax free from France and Germany. Some of the details you may find in the press as of yesterday morning. Does the name Mr. Raul Weil at all strike a bell? The answer is no. He was a Swiss banker arrested in Italy for a crime of the United States and now is cooling his heels in a Florida jail cell. So you will see that when it comes to at least illegal tax accounts, countries have no rules. Even the pressure that India has raised over Cyprus, of course that is fully within the rules. But this is a part of the work that is going on across the world to prevent illegal base erosion. I am not dealing with the tax planning strategies. <coughs> also what does that video show you? A certain amount of hypocrisy. You have three statements from Prime Minister Cameron, the UK Treasury Minister and Mrs. Hodge. What does that show you all when you all are drafting these certificates? You will be examined and your documents will be examined by way beyond the court systems. Today, companies and chartered accountants, this was only a bit, the big four were separately examined by the UK Parliamentary Committee and one question which was there was, all of you have offices in tax havens, why? So you will, you will be questioned. So all I can say is that this thing will be there when you do your work. Why do I say a certain amount of hypocrisy? Look at what the Treasury Minister said. He said, I have no problem with accountants going around with glossy brochures promoting United Kingdom because that brings jobs. Countries do want jobs. So you must remember there will be a counterbalance. Countries are not going to not want investment. They are going to continue to attract investment. Where this line is between tax avoidance and tax evasion, nobody knows right now. Everybody says what you are doing is illegal. So change the rules. I do believe that this is going to happen. Look at the incident which was mentioned about the payment of tax. For the first time, 20 million was paid in the UK Treasury by a particular company and it seemed to be voluntary. Was it voluntary or did it have anything to do with the demonstrations that you saw on your screen? 
I have never heard of a voluntary tax. I only know about my Australian friend who couldn't pay tax and he couldn't sleep because he had these problems of not paying tax. I'm sure that doesn't affect most people. But unfortunately, he couldn't sleep because he had not paid his tax. Finally, he woke up and wrote a letter to the Australian tax department saying, I have not been able to sleep for months because I have not paid my fair share of tax. I'm enclosing my check for $1,500 Australian dollars, please accept. And he added a PS. If I can't still sleep, I'll send you the balance in the morning. <laughs> so if you will see, my concern is really that this debate goes way beyond the courts, way beyond the normal systems of analysis. And when you are summoned by this, also if you will look, again I am showing you only what is available in the public domain. Mrs. Hodge, her own family company you saw the last screen is alleged to have paid far less tax than any of the companies she was examining. So I think we know that everyone is doing what is accepted today. And therefore I think pointing fingers is dangerous. But remember that as professionals, especially the chartered accountants professionals, you are now going to be examined by several bodies. You don't know which body is going to examine you. Of course, I hope it's not times now. But, but today, people can make a difference. If you look at the AAP phenomenon, who will you give credit to this for this phenomenon? Someone may give it to Mr. Azare. I would like to give it to a chartered accountant by the name of Mr. Vinod Rai, the former Comptroller Auditor General of India. Whether you agree with him, whether he stepped into policy debates, whether he should have stayed out of it, the point is his reports triggered off all the investigations, triggered off the movement, and therefore, like Mr. Session, one accountant has made a difference to this. My final bit of advice, when you have this confusion, when you have this chaos and you don't know, how are you going to draft a certificate? How are you going to advise your clients? The policy that I would do, or the policy that I would do is, whenever you give an opinion, whenever you speak on the phone, assume a third party is listening in to what you do or what you say. Do it in the knowledge that you will have to defend it in a court of law. I am not asking you to defend it in any other place for the present. Most importantly, do not assume it will go unnoticed. Today, things will leak out, will come out from sources which you have no control over. Just look at this issue on illegal bank accounts. Who would have thought countries would pay bank officials to leak details? Countries would pay them bribes. Who thought that? So there are no rules in this game. It is going to come out. It may come out in some other NGO's letter. It may come out in some NGO's investigation. So assume that your certificates will come out. Once you do it with that background, you will then know how to draft it. Thank you. Uh, we will have a Q&A session, but before that we'll have Mr. Trivedi's concluding remarks. You please write down the uh, there's a chat given to you. Please write down a question on that. It should be easy for us to take. Uh, well, uh, you were extremely candid. Not merely did you talk about the law, intricacies, the judgments of Supreme Court, judgments of the tribunal, judgments of Delhi High Court and the Andhra Pradesh High Court. But you also mentioned about some of the harsh realities, and that is very important. Times are changing. <coughs> Who would have thought the Amadmi Party, some ramshackle group of activists, 
as somebody described, getting into power. And I believe that the chartered accountants should try to make them feel about their social and moral responsibilities. I remember in one of the lectures I was sharing the platform with Mr. Shivanan, who was our police commissioner. And he says, Mr. Trivedi, I have seen in most of the financial frauds, there is always a chartered accountant behind. So just as you are talking about, you know that. But chartered accountants have also crossed limits in some cases. There are some very fine examples, but then there are people. I have had, as a lawyer, an occasion to look at Panama's company law, Bahamas Trust Act, and I was surprised that there are some islands in the Pacific with a population of not more than 10,000, who have parliament, who have a high court, and they are also tax havens. And I told my client that if you go there, and tomorrow if a Sumani comes, then the entire island will be wiped out. Where will your documents go? So I think there is a place where we have to limit ourselves. As you rightly said, the chartered accountants are probably, like many people in the legal field also, they are probably one of the best brains. But it is a tragedy of our time that the best brains in any country are devoted to telling people how to avoid their taxes. I remember the old story which I always used to narrate that a very wealthy man in America had a very petite secretary and like all demanding secretaries, she wanted a fur coat and the millionaire went to his chartered accountant and he said, how do I give it? He didn't in America and he didn't have the black money. He wanted to give it from his bank account. And the chartered accountant scratched his head for a little and said, very easy. You see, I inquire it for covering my typewriter. Because there is no law which says the typewriter can only be covered by a letter case. You can use a fur coat also for that purpose. So we can find ways and means. But the point is this, we must realize the, real, the, 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 the ground realities. I can tell you one thing that he has talked about the multilateral treaties, bilateral treaties, and there was considerable discussion about the Bali summit and about the food subsidies which India is paying, whether it's a deterrent to multilateral treaties. And a stage came when the entire conference was going to break. You imagine if these multilateral trade treaties are broken, if multilateral this trade uh, direct tax avoidance treaties are broken, there will be total chaos. Every country will say that, all right, we don't care for double taxation avoidance treaty or double taxation avoid and non-avoidance of treaties. All that we do not recognize. We will straight away take the money and it will be chaos. So we have to find out some ways and means. And as he rightly said, we are becoming a global village. And rightly, he said about the moral tax code. Moral tax rate is something which I will be very happy to find all the countries in the United Nations, they accept one tax rate. So there is nothing like a tax haven. If you want to become a member of the United Nations, this is your tax rate. This is a moral tax rate. As you rightly say, you may have it between 15 and 20 percent, which is affordable by everybody. Otherwise, I am afraid that the way in which people are trying to, especially in underdeveloped countries, developing countries, there is huge demand. There is so much of poverty. And this is something which is very shocking. As he rightly said, we are a growing economy, we are one of getting one of the largest economy. But you must also admit that we are we are the we, we are one of those countries, we are probably the only country where there is maximum of poverty. You see people, children begging on the streets. This is something which is unusual. It doesn't even happen in Afghanistan, I was told by an, a man in the foreign services. So something has to be done. This pressure will ultimately mount. And that is why, as he said, when you are talking with anybody, he said you think that it is only, not only two-way traffic, the third person listening. I think the third person which is listening is your conscience. Whenever you advise, take into consideration your conscience. 
take into consideration God who is going to ultimately punish anybody who is going doing wrong. And you bearing this in mind, you should give the correct advice. I think this is the moral uh, uh, advice which he has given to all of us, which I think is very important for today's meeting. Thank you very much. Every country is a tax hungry and each one wants a bigger pie of taxes. Our chartered accountants having the expertise to analyze complex international transactions and is there a possibility of CAs not being allowed to do, not being allowed to issue transfer pricing reports? I think I'm nobody to answer this question <laughs> and I think the chartered accountants should, I frankly, what I have seen of transfer pricing and the reports that I have seen, I do believe that they are a mix of what charter accountants do and what economists do. It's a combination of both. All I can say is that I think the CA profession is probably the most qualified to do this. I can't see any other profession, certainly not the lawyers. I think we, we are not that great at uh, the, the work that is being done to do it. So, but as, again, as I said, this is really for the chart accountants to answer. The next question, whether the client should go to the transfer pricing officer for asking the method of computation of ALP that can, no, method of computation that can be used for ALP. I don't think this is an answer that is different. You would not go to a tax officer to ask him anything in the beginning because we have no system of settling disputes in India. I think you should do what you need to do correctly and then leave it to the courts to answer the question as to whether you've done it correctly. Do you think that signing of multilateral instruments by India and other countries, political and other countries, <coughs> is practical. I think if you're going to amend treaties, you can't amend thousands of them. So if you want to move fast on exchange of information, multilateral treaties is the only answer way forward. Finally, BEPS. What about the government's responsibility to deserve taxes? The way they spend, is this under discussion? The answer is, I sincerely hope it was. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not. It should be. And I may end by saying, I have always believed that, and taking what Mr. Trivedi says of the poverty that there is in our country, that those who are relatively well off should not grudge 30%. This was a few years ago. After Mr. Vinod Rai's work, I grudged that 30%. Thank you so much. Uh, may I request Nitin to carry out a word of thanks, please? Thank you for your patience. Uh, just a few <coughs> announcements in the beginning. We have some excellent lineup of uh, lecture meetings coming up. On 15th January, Gautam Nayak will speak on charitable trust recent issues. On 29th January, Hero Rai, uh, advocate, will speak on important income tax rulings of 2013. And on 5th February, Nilesh Vikramsi will speak on commonly found mistakes in financial statements and SEBI review of qualified audit reports. Friends, I'm also happy to uh, inform you that we've uh, done one very successful project uh, that has been completed in Uttarakhand under Uttarakhand Relief Fund that we've collected. One school in Gopeshwar in Chamoli district uh, has been completely reconstructed or rather uh, reinforced uh, without uh, you know uh, building it from scratch uh, so that was more environment friendly advanced engineering structural engineering technique that was adopted and we are also exploring some more projects in Uttarakhand. Uh, I request you all to continue to support this great initiative and our contributions line are still open. Um, now coming to the pleasant task of vote of thanks, friends, as the Chinese proverb says, may you live an exciting time. So we are up for some real exciting, uh, you know, uh, 
time with technology and instant information uh, driving transparency and accountability not just for governments but many more entities. Uh, we must offer this word of thanks to Porus for bringing great honor to India and Indian professionals. Today, today Porus has presented caps to us, knowledge augmentation and team shifting so that we can counter bets. With that, I request all of you to carry a very loud word of thanks. I also request you all to uh, carry a very loud vote of thanks to our chairman of the evening, Shri Vaiti Trivedi, for sharing his knowledge and wisdom. Thank you, sir.